I'd like to begin this talk with a personal experience going back to half a century ago. That is the year of 1973 or 4, when nonlinear dynamics was still early phase. <coughs> so, uh, people working in this field of so few. It was about that time that I changed my research subject from statistical physics of thermodynamic phase transition to pattern formation and self-organization in far from thermal equilibrium. This change of my research interest made me feel a little uneasy at the same time because this was as if I was leaving the hometown and moving to the land where determinism was a dominant way of thinking. But such feeling of uneasiness was relieved by the following message, which I found in the book of Glansdorf and Prigogine published in 1971, it says that classical thermodynamics is essentially a theory of destruction of structure. Such a theory has to be completed by the theory of creation of structure. These words encourage me to step into this new field very rich field of science. <clears throat> the first thing which attracted my curiosity was Zaikin Jabotinsky's Nature Paper of 1970, in which they reported expanding circular waves in a spontaneously oscillating because of Jabotinsky reaction. I also learned of spiral wave pattern shortly after. I read Zaikin Jabotin's paper for the first time three or four years after its publication. Still, I couldn't find any theory yet which explained successfully this wave pattern with mathematical language. So I wished to do this myself, ignoring that I was still a beginner of nonlinear dynamics. Although a three component differential equation model called the originator was already known for this reaction system, it seemed hopeless to relate such an elaborated model to relate the observed wave pattern. So I thought as anyone may think of, that much simpler hypothetical reaction diffusion model would be enough for the purpose of qualitative explanation. <clears throat> One such model was the so-called Brussellator, invented by Prigozhin's group of Brussels. The corresponding two-component reaction diffusion equations of this form it was easy to confirm to find a spatially uniform steady solution exhibit the Hoppen bifurcation. But how to go further beyond the onset of oscillation was the first problem to be faced with. Indeed, a limit cycle oscillator seemed to be a very tough mathematical object and how to deal with spatial variation or spatial degrees of freedom was also a problem. One thing which was helpful was my earlier experience of phase transition theory, in which the dynamics of small amplitude order parameter A near and above the second order critical point was often studied using the simple 
phenomenological evolution equation like this, including a cubic nonlinearity and diffusion, and possibly with additive noise, which was crucial to the study of critical fluctuations. <coughs> the so-called time-dependent Ginzburg-Landau equation for superconducting transition is an analog to this equation, but its form is a little more elaborate. A similar idea was being introduced to the study of instability and self-organization phenomena in far from thermal equilibrium. And such an approach was highly recommended by Hermann Haken in the context of his proposed new field of science, synergetics. In fluid dynamics also, Newell and Whitehead derived a small amplitude equation near the onset of rayleigh benard convection. And Stewartson and Stewart did a similar work for plane quasi flow. Among these works, I was particularly interested in newer Whitehead work because they developed a simple algorithm for constructing a small amplitude equation perturbatively from the original fluid dynamical equation. Although rarely banal convection and steady state bifurcation, their methods seemed easily applicable to the instability, uh, occurrence of instability in reaction diffusion systems. As it expected, a small amplitude equation for a complex order amplitude A was successfully derived, which is now called the complex ginzburg landau equation. But this was only for a special model oscillator. This work was done with my boss, Toshio Tsuzuki, who was an expert of superconductivity theory. We submitted a short paper on this work to physics letters, the paper entitled Reductive Perturbation Approach to Chemical Instability. The term reductive perturbation was borrowed from the same term used for deriving the soliton equations from general class of wave equations. Unfortunately, our paper was rejected by physics letters. Perhaps we should have been more careful about the paper title because the reason for rejection was that chemical instability unsuitable for physics letters. I don't remember the precise wording, but the essence of the comment was like this. The comment was signed by the editor-in-chief of physics letters who was a rather famous physicist. He recommended to sub resubmit the paper to chemistry-related journal, but we were sure that our work was physics itself. So we resubmitted it to another physics journal, Progress of Theoretical Physics, published from Yukawa Institute, Kyoto. This time the paper was accepted immediately. The complex ginzburg landau equation, of course, derived from a much more general class of reaction diffusion systems. And this fact was reported two years later, 1976, again with uh, Toshio Tsuzuki. The method of deriving center manifold, sorry, the method for deriving uh, Ginzburg-Landau type uh, small amplitude equation is often called a center manifold reduction. But in those days, my knowledge of dynamical system concepts and knowledge is so poor that I didn't know the word center manifold. But if I knew this term, that wouldn't have been so helpful because how to include 
spatial degrees of freedom on large systems still remains out of range of the center manifold theory even today. In any case, mathematical rigor was not a matter of concern. We thought that it would be sufficient if our theory could be accepted by the majority of physicists. So next subject I'd like to talk is how I was led by chance to the discovery of what is called the kuramoto sibasinski equation. While I was making a preliminary analysis uh, complex kintsugu landau equation derived before, a family of plane wave solutions were easily found. I thought that these waves might have something to do with the wave pattern observed, but I didn't know how to push this thought forward. This was partly because I was ignorant of the fact that pacemaker impurities were involved in the formation of expanding concentric waves, and that topological defects were needed for the creation of spiral pattern. Even worse, this ignorance of mine led me a completely wrong speculation that the spontaneous reappearing wave pattern might be a result of some kind of instability occurring to a uniformly oscillating field. <coughs> In retrospect, however, this misconception may have been a lucky misconception because this finally led me to the discovery of the equation called by my name and Svasinski. <coughs> Gintzburg Landau, complex Gintzburg Landau equation derived before, certainly showed this kind of instability, which is now called the Benjamin Fair instability. <coughs> and the parameter condition for the instability was also satisfied by the brass solitaire which are, we are dealing with. So I was really eager to know what happened after the instability. I imagine if I were faced with the same problem today, in this day and age, I would possibly resort to a numerical simulation of complex Kintzburg Landau equation at first. Indeed, doing such a simulation would be easy enough even for undergraduate students today. But in those days, nearly half a century ago, the situation was quite different. Although young scientists today possibly couldn't imagine, in those days, we didn't have such things as computer terminals or workstation or even PC. So we had to start numerical work by writing down the program on programming sheets first. Then the written program was stored on punch cards, line by line. And then we had to go to the computer center of the university, carrying a bundle of punched cards to feed them to the computer. Even worse, the return paper sheets showed no results in the worst case, simply because there was just one program error. Since the situation was like this, I was reluctant to do simulation. <coughs> so I decided to proceed only with paper and pencil. So I came back to the original question of the greatest concern, what happened after the instability? To study this, the first thing to be noticed was that this instability occurring to a uniformly oscillating field 
is a long scale phase instability. That is, the instability starts with the unstable growth of phase fluctuations with very long scale wavelengths. So it was expected that after the termination of the unstable growth, these long scale phase fluctuations evolve in time very slowly. This naturally led to the idea that rapidly decaying amplitude disturbances could safely be eliminated adiabatically. And the whole dynamics could be described only in terms of phase. This idea was correct, and the resulting phase equation was expressed in the form of a derivative expansion like this, with small critical parameter epsilon appearing before the first term of negative phase diffusion. For simplicity here, we uh, show only one dimensional case. <coughs> then we had to select out the most important terms from this expansion series. For this purpose, the scaling idea was very useful. Specifically, we rescale space x time t and phase phi by assigning a super power of epsilon to each quantity. Then, omitting all details, the first three terms on the right-hand side turned out the most dominant, dropping all the other higher-order terms and making use of other two parameters, lambda and mu, suitably inserting the scale transformation, the parameter-free equation called by my name and Svasinski was finally obtained. The next question was how the solution of this equation behaved. I remember one day my boss Suzuki glanced at this equation written on the blackboard. He said, this might be turbulence. Actually, I was also thinking of the same possibility myself, but only vaguely. So I thought, if his words were true, all my effort of working with paper and pencil would be a waste of time. Numerical work was inevitable. But I was not good at this, so my coworker, Tomoji Yamada, did it, who was an old friend of mine since our undergraduate days. I clearly remember the day when Yamada rushed into my office, carrying numerical data under his arm, being apparently excited, and said that the data was showing genuine turbulence. I think this was a moment that the concept of phase turbulence was established, but only theoretically, of course. At around the same time, Otto Ressler, who is famous for Ressler model of chaos, was also interested in the possibility of spatial-temporal chaos in reaction diffusion systems. And he was doing some work on this program himself. I often met Ressler when I was staying in Stuttgart at Hermann Harkins Institute as a visiting professor. Ressler and I had a lot of discussion on our common interest over lunch. I suppose it was about that time that Sivasinski derived independently the same equation as mine for weakly unstable frame front of combustion. His paper appeared in Acta Astronautica in 1977, which was a journal quite unfamiliar to me, so I didn't know his work at all. I learned his work for the first time sometime after I returned home. 
Actually, I heard it. I, I learned it from Otto Ressler's letter. Because Ressler seemed to have met Sibasinski in a certain conference and heard of his work there. I suppose Sibasinski also heard of my work on the same occasion. After that, there were a few times exchange of letters and papers between Sibasinski and me. Now, uh, <coughs> let me proceed to another work of my own, that is, the proposal of the so-called Kuramoto model. This work was motivated by Art Winfrey's paper entitled Biological Rhythm and the Behavior of Population of Coupled Oscillators, published in 1967. In those days, theoretical biology was no, not so familiar to me. So it was seven years after its publication that I read Winfrey's paper for the first time. Winfrey's claim is that there should exist a critical condition for the onset of collective oscillation in large populations of globally coupled phase oscillators with random frequency distribution. This gave me a fresh surprise because I had never imagined this kind of phase transition with dynamic order parameter to exist in far from farmer equilibrium. Actually, Winfrey's paper is not an easy paper to read. He used very few equations and his argument on the existence of synchronization phase transition didn't seem very persuasive. But his original idea was very attracting, so I was completely absorbed in his theory. Winfrey's model has this form although he didn't write down his own model in an equation form. Here, uh, z of phi sub j is the phase sensitivity function of the oscillator j with phase phi sub j. And capital X of t is what Winfrey called the influence function. And in this case, it's given by the sum of the coupling forces coming from all the other oscillators. Winfrey employed a very simple functional forms for z of phi and small x of phi. But this product form of coupling didn't seem easy to handle. So I wondered if there might not be a way of simplifying this model so as to allow mathematical analysis. The idea which hit on me was that the complex Kintzberg-Landau equation derived before might be used after some modifications. The modifications made were the following. The space was discretized. Diffusion coupling was replaced with global linear coupling with real coefficient. And the natural frequencies were made randomly distributed. And finally, the limb cycle orbit was assumed to be strongly attracting. The result of all these modifications was my model with much simpler coupling function. The next problem was how to make an analysis of this model. From my knowledge of an elementary theory phase transition, magnetic phase transition for plane planar spins, I saw that if an order parameter W was suitably defined analogously to spontaneous magnetization, then 
my proposed equation could be transformed into a self-consistency equation for the order parameter w. This was correct, but I admit that uh, mathematically speaking, there was a non-trivial logical jump in deriving a self-consistency equation, but I took advantage of Fisch's privilege of ignoring all mathematically rigorous arguments. Fortunately, the self-consistency equation could be solved analytically. This was thanks to the Lorentzian distribution of frequency distribution employed, Lorentzian form. By the way, it was Ott Antonsen's work of 2008 which made clear the reason why the frequency distribution given by rational function makes my model system mathematically tractable. The solution of the self-consistency equation was such that a non-trivial branch bifurcates at the critical coupling strength case of C, implying the onset of collective oscillation. Without mathematical argument, I took it as a matter of fact that an exchange of stability occurs across a critical point by which the quiescent collective state gives way to collective oscillation. I wrote a short article for the proceedings of the International Symposium held in Kyoto in 1975. But unfortunately, this article was never cited for the subsequent four or five years, as far as I know. <laughs> but this was not surprising at all because this article was too unkind to the readers. It was too short, just two pages long, plus a few lines typewritten with large spacing. I have sometimes been asked why I didn't write a regular paper. To be honest, I didn't have confidence in my work, in my model. My model seemed to me too unrealistic compared with Winfrey's model. The cold reactions from, to my work from some of established species around me were also discouraging. But I know all these excuses are unreasonable because this was all due to my inability of evaluating objectively the own work. I was still too premature as a nonlinear physicist. So, during this period, the four or five years, my proposed model was almost in sleep. But the situation changed when I received a brief letter from Winfrey himself. In the letter, he praised my model very highly, but regretting the shortness of the article. He also proposed a very important question regarding the stability of the collective state obtained from the self-consistency equation. This was really a tough mathematical problem, and naturally I didn't have an answer. Indeed, and unlike usual bifurcation of dynamical systems, Conventional stability analysis is unavailable here. Also, no variational principle can apply because a potential like free energy is non-existent in this case. So how to work out a theory on the stability and order parameter, dynamics of order parameter was to become a long-standing problem in later years. 
A number of theories challenge this problem. To name a few, Mirolo, Strogatz, Crawford, Otto Antonsen, Chiba. Among others, Otto Antonsen's work triggered a flood of publications on its application and generalization. Shortly after, I received a letter from Winfrey. He published a monograph, The Geometry of Biological Time, in which he referred to my model and gave its brief description. This was so encouraging to me, and four years later, I also included in my book, Chemical Oscillations, Waves, and Turbulence, a more detailed account of my model and its analysis. <clears throat> Not limited to this work, Winfrey gave me uh, encouraging words from time to time by email, even from the sick bed of the last stage of his life. Although he was two years younger than me, I have always been looking him up as a teacher of life. Well, as I talked about above, the two phase equations I derived, one describing the phase turbulence and another synchronization phase transition, was a result of the so-called phase reduction of the complex Ginzburg-Landau equation or its variant. From this, it's expected that describing co uh, oscillator dynamics only by using phase could be a powerful way of studying coupled oscillator systems in general, not just for highly symmetric models such as complex Kintzburg Landau type oscillator systems. Indeed, the idea of phase reduction has a long history ever since Malkin's theorem, which appeared in the middle of the last century. I also formulated my own theory of phase reduction in my Springer book nearly 40 years ago. And over the last several tens of years, many people employed the phase uh, description as a common tool for the study of coupled oscillators. <clears throat> the phase description is generally applicable when the individual oscillators are weakly perturbed, typically from the coupling force from the other oscillators. Weak external drive, weak noise, and weak heterogeneity may also be included. <clears throat> the commonly used phase reduction is a lowest order theory with respect to the weakness of the perturbation. For most practical purposes, this would be enough, but there may be exceptional cases where the lowest order theory turns out insufficient. For instance, the coefficient of the Fourth derivative of the kuramoto sibasinski equation cannot be uh, correctly given by the lowest order theory. In any case, it would be desirable to formulate a more systematic theory, including arbitrary higher order effects. As long as diffusion coupled fields of oscillators are concerned, such a theory was presented in my Springer book mentioned above. For oscillators in discrete space, however, no systematic theory existed for a rather long time, possibly because its practical use seemed too hard to find. But, a, but such a theory is also possible, and this was out, outlined in my review paper with Hiroya Nakao a few years ago. 
In this way, the two representative reduction schemes for oscillator systems, namely the center manifold type reduction and the phase reduction, have almost been established. Although there may be still room for further development, such as an extension of phase reduction to quantum oscillators. In any case, the reduced oscillator models and their variants made us possible to explore the world of coupled oscillators far deeper than ever. Of course, there are merits and demerits in the respective reduction theories, but they are complementary with each other. So by combining these tools, relatively large area of the field of coupled oscillators could be covered. Now, let me just go back to the basics of the reduction theory, focusing on the central importance of the quantity called neutral modes or neutrally stable dynamical degrees of freedom. The importance of neutral modes will easily be seen from the fact that the formulation of each reduction theory starts with a neutrally stable state, where only non-vanishing dynamical degree of freedom is a neutral mode, while all the other degrees of freedom die out. Now, we introduce there a weak perturbation. Then this neutral mode will no longer completely neutral and will start evolving very slowly. And the equation describing this slow evolution is nothing but the reduced equation such as small amplitude equation and phase equation. What kind of neutral mode is involved in each reduction theory is clear. One is a critical eigen mode of the Hopin bifurcation, and the other is a phase of a freely oscillating limit cycle. If we broaden our perspective, these two kinds of neutral modes may be regarded as specific examples of the to more general classes of neutral modes existing in nature universally. The first class will appear on the boundary of a structurally stable regime where the system is not stable nor unstable, that is neutral stable. The second class of neutral mode exists whenever the system stays in a broken continuous symmetry like a limit cycle oscillation, which breaks the translational symmetry of time. The second class of neutral modes are called the number goals of modes. <coughs> How universally these two classes exist in nature is remarkable. Indeed, loss of structural stability, or more generally, a sudden change of phase from one to another occurs in every scale of nature, from the scale of high energy physics to human scale, and possibly even to much larger scales too. Complete the same may be said for the broken continuous symmetry. Well, it may be questioned whether or not Universal classes of neutral modes are limited to these two classes. Actually, there is a third class, which is conserved quantities. Conserved quantities are neutrally stable simply because an arbitrary change of their values is conserved, similarly to phase. We know the classical reduction theory of Enskog and Chapman, very old theory, which takes advantage of this nature of conserved quantities for deriving the Navier-Stokes equation 
from the Boltzmann gas kinetic equation by means of a method quite similar to the systematic reduction theory of, uh, of uh, systematic theory of phase reduction. Now, let me come back to the issue of coupled oscillators and let me say something about how our reduced oscillator models can serve for practical purposes. In connection with this problem, there is one thing which should be considered seriously. That is a critical opinion which said that the reduced oscillator models such as the coupled phase oscillators are too simplistic so that the power of their power of describing real dynamics would be so weak. I partly agree with this opinion, but at the same time, I would say that the primary role of the reduced models to provide a rough sketch of the reality and not its precise picture by which the specific aspects of individual systems will largely be cut off, but instead something universal shared commonly by seemingly different systems will become clear. On the other hand, one may wish to have a more uh, precise picture of the reality of real systems. Then, all we have to do is to construct a more realistic model and work with it. But what's important is even in that case, the knowledge obtained from the analysis of the reduced models can serve as a powerful guide telling us in which way we proceed so that we may not get lost in the complexity of the realistic mathematical models employed with high dimensional state space and high dimensional parameter space. But as long as the coupled phase oscillator model is concerned, this seemingly abstract model may happen to become a model of direct practical use. One such case would be that the functional form of the phase coupling of this model employed can be inferred from a large amount of real data. There may also be the case that some device of desired function is manufactured using artificial coupled phase oscillators. Apart from how to understand what's going on in real systems, one may wish to control the oscillator dynamics taking place there. Suppose, for instance, the observed collective synchronization of a cellular assembly in a human body causes trouble, as in the case of Parkinsonian disease. And one may wish to, to have it suppressed. Another possible case would be the occurrence of anomalous circadian oscillation. Then its regular behavior should better be recovered through some action on the assembly of clock cells. For these cases, the analysis of the reduced model of oscillator assembly may suggest an efficient way of control. No matter how different the model assembly may look from the real assembly, there may be some common underlying mechanism by which the collective oscillator dynamics be controlled as desired. Although not directly related to the practical use, our reduced oscillator models may help to discover the new types of behavior of coupled oscillators. 
if I'm allowed to refer to my own work with Kowaka Badok talk, the so-called chimera states will give one such example. This exotic behavior of oscillators was first found in a homogeneously extended field of phase oscillators with non-local coupling, where the system breaks symmetry and the whole space is clearly divided into synchronous and asynchronous domains. The naming chimera states was coined by Stephen Strogatz, and its original meaning was largely extended thereafter, by which a flood of papers, related papers, have been published up to this day. <coughs> Many other intriguing oscillator dynamics have been discovered through model analysis, although I will not refer to each of them. Any, in, in any case, many of these findings wouldn't have been possible without drastic dynamical reduction. Of course, the realizability of all these dynamics should finally be tested using more realistic oscillator models or in experiments. In concluding this talk, I'd like to say that the science of coupled oscillators are highly interdisciplinary in nature. The mathematical method, theoretical models, and universal concepts established there are already rich enough. With these tools, we are still on the way of exploring this complex world, hand in hand with many other tools developed in different branches of nonlinear science. Thank you very much. <laughs>